So I, I want to say welcome to Bishop Sally Dick, who was elected bishop in 2004, yes. correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then served the Minnesota Annual Conference from 2004 to 2012. Correct. And then to Bishop Bruce O, who was elected bishop in 2000 and served the Dakota, Minnesota area from 2012 to 2020. And you both retired, sort of, kind of, <laughs> not really, but sort of retired. Um, at the end of 2020 to take on roles of the council bishop for you, the ecumenical officer, and you, the Sorry. executive secretary. Executive secretary, yeah, get the executive in there. <laughs> Give him two. And then Bishop right. Dick, you took on another interim role to help out in California and Nevada. So you're yes. really both kind of retired, but we're celebrating your retirement here at um, the jurisdictional conference, right. finally. So I thought it'd be fun to do a little reflecting with you on the life of a bishop. So I'm gonna take you way back uh, to 2000 and 2004 when you were a candidate for bishop. So what prompted you to kind of put yourself into this role of a bishop and, and what did you hope that you could do, you could influence, you could accomplish from the office of a bishop? You know, people had kind of urged me to do it and um, it was when, you know, I began to really recognize how important leadership is and that um, a good leader can make a big difference. I I, th I thought you know I can I think I can do this, mm. and um, we'll see what happens. Um, and I and so I ran and, um, you know I think that when people decide they're going to become a bishop, it may not always be what they think it's going to be. It's um, it's a lot of it's a lot of work that goes unseen. So what what prompted you, or what did you hope you could accomplish, or do, or influence by? being a bishop? Uh, much like uh, Bishop Dick shared, I, I think what prompted me is a number of people starting to say to me, we think you have the gifts mm. uh, that, that uh, the church needs. We think you have gifts for uh, leadership. And, and then, uh, you know, I made it a, a matter of my own prayer life, too, mm. because I, w I was aware that I had some gifts. I mean, I knew I had kind of visionary skills and and strategic planning skills and things like that. But part of what I really struggled with is that what the church needed right now. Mm. And so when others came along and said, yeah, we think you're the right person to do this, um, I made myself available. And of course, I ran twice. I was not elected the first time. Well, you both did, right? We yeah. both did. Yeah, and and uh, that was so good. Yeah, mm. yeah. That w it, it was liberating. Mm. It was like, okay, I don't need to do this. Mm. I don't need to want this I really can make myself available and it let the church and if decide. the spirit moves and yeah. the church says yes yeah. then yeah so let me ask just a little bit so you you go into this thinking this is what I want to do and this is what maybe this role of bishop is about so how did reality match expectation where did you get surprised well I mean probably both of us have been around bishops and the work of the mm -hmm. bishop uh, as a district superintendent or whatever else and so it wasn't a total surprise, but you know, a lot uh, just comes back to what the bishop decides. You know, it's a, at least for me, it's always been a sometimes 24 hour consuming. It, it, you know, you may not look like you're working at the moment, but it's, uh, it can, can will sometimes say, What are you thinking about? I can see you thinking, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what you're always doing. And so it's with you, you're, you're thinking about it, you're, you're maybe you're problem solving or trying to prepare. Uh, and, and so it's, I think it's more consuming even than I thought it was gonna be. And more than like as a local church pastor or as a superintendent, because those are also consuming yeah, roles. There's something about this role and kind of stewarding the church that. Yeah, uh, at least for me, it's been that way. Although I also think I have pretty good um, boundaries about working oh maybe not but um <laughs> <laughs> you don't get into these no. roles if you're just sort of a laid back yeah, uh, no. you're not good at saying no yeah. <laughs> well that's the problem neither am i <laughs> <laughs> you know it keeps you up at night sometimes um the work that we have to do and you know to do really really hard work as graciously as you possibly can yeah you know for me what <clears throat> what I'm thinking about is there was this uh, watershed moment, uh, probably a year in, uh, to my episcopacy in West Ohio. I I had been assigned there, um, brand new bishop, following Bishop Craig. I mean, mm -hmm. like who is beloved. Yes, and 
not only beloved, but really effective. I mean, there, there were not bigger shoes mm. to fill, and I was scared to death. <laughs> there was a retreat scheduled, and they asked me to sort of cast vision. Now, I had always been taught, you don't get out ahead of the people with this, but I thought, what the heck? So I went in and I, I cast a kind of a vision for the conference. There was a really positive response. And from that moment on, I thought, I am where God wants me to be, mm -hmm. nice. doing what God wants me to do. Now, over 20 years, what sort of eroded that initial enthusiasm was having to deal with complaints, mm -hmm. having to deal with conflicts, uh, watching the church um, get while you know mired down in in um, some of the structural regulatory kinds of stuff that we do and you know over time um, that eats at your soul mm -hmm. it really does um, I don't think I ever lost my passion for wanting to lead I always tried to put myself in positions like going out to preach at churches where you were really appreciated, <laughs> where, where you could still cast vision mm -hmm. and stuff. But it, 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 it takes its toll. It's, yeah. it's, as Bishop Dick said, it's all consuming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you don't know that going in. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you look back, kind of over your tenure as a, a bishop, it, is, is there a point where you want to look back and go, you know, I, I was really proud of that, or the, here is something I think I really did make an impact or a contribution to that, you know, if you're kind of talking legacy, what's, what's the legacy of this work? Is there things you kind of look back on and go, yeah, I was glad I got to be a part of that and to help facilitate that? I really wanted people to develop holy, healthy habits, but also prayer yes. and Bible study. And I really wanted people to develop their own spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so the gospel imperatives became really important as, as wanting a whole conference to kind of focus on those. And then the other was the outreach. Mm -hmm. And uh, from the moment I got there, it was just like, how can we just do things differently? So of course, um, what people who were there when I was there remember, uh, maybe, is you know the very, Practically the first month I was there, they announced that the Vikings were going to play on Christmas Eve. <laughs> now, I have to tell you, in Cleveland, Browns always played on Christmas Eve, and it was at 7.30 when the Christmas Eve service was, but this was at noon. Yeah. So I said, I said well, all these churches were complaining. I go, let's flip it. You know, that's what I wanted people to always do. Let's just take what we have and flip it. And so we went, I said, we're going down there and we're going to Christmas Carol. It was 20 below zero. This is one of the coldest days. With wind <laughs> standing. <laughs> I have never been so cold in my life. Um, but before we went, I said, we've already, we've already made our witness because we were in the paper on radio because we were going to do this. Um, and so I just wanted people, I've always just wanted people to take what Whatever it is you have, use it. You know, just use it. And those gospel imperatives that started under your tenure right, have continued. Right. So we right. still talk about the gospel imperatives in the Minnesota Conference, Reach New People, Girl in Love of God, and Neighbor, Heal a Broken World is still kind of our mandate for how we're called to be the church. I think that's so, great. Yeah, enduring. What about you? What, yeah, anything it's, you look back I, on? And, I still, uh, I still rubs me the wrong way that I had to admit that Bishop Dick was right uh, <laughs> about those imperatives. <laughs> you know, when I went, when I came, mm -hmm. I had Bishop Dick in this year saying, whatever you do, don't merge these two conferences. Mm. And I had Bishop Kesey in this year saying, whatever you do, don't merge these two conferences. They're very distinct cultures uh, and that needs to be respected. Uh, you can lead the area, but don't merge the conferences. That was the, that was the word. And uh, it didn't take me long to realize that that was right. Mm -hmm. so and he the, hated admitted that uh, too. <laughs> yeah. But, but having, having grown up in the Dakotas, I, I, I mean, I knew that culture. I knew, I knew it didn't take long to see the distinctives. Uh, so one of the things I feel the best about is that we were able to figure out some very creative ways to share leadership and therefore multiply mm -hmm. leadership across the area without having to yeah. do the structural merger, which would quite frankly would have probably consumed my entire mm -hmm. eight years mm -hmm. there, just sorting that out. 
So, um, and, and, be, and because of that, we were able to put some resources into new church development and did a great hire. And, and, and there are other positions around leadership development that we were able to do be, uh, and figure out ways to share. Even our communications right. areas figured out ways to use the gifts that each had to. So I, I feel very. And our area camping is right, still area going camping strong is at still the area going camp. very In fact, good. it's one of the yeah. strongest camping programs in the connection. Yeah, so, I, I, uh, so I feel really good about that. I would say the other thing is I, I uh, and this would be a little longer than just the, the eight years of in the Dakotas and Minnesota, but um, I, I feel good about some of the things I was able to do around helping to develop leaders. Mm. And uh, if there's a legacy, you know, I always, I, I've said, if, if, I hope my legacy, you don't know, it's, others will judge, as Bishop Dick said, <laughs> but I hope my legacy will be that I, I helped uh, in some small way to bring along that next generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both of you set a, a great standard for uh, what it means to be uh, faithful, authentic leaders, but also what it means to keep calling the annual conference to excellence. You never let the annual, both of you, I remember annual conference session, it was just like, we're not settling. And, and together, how much money do we raise for Imagine No Malaria? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. A lot of money. So money. over a million yeah. dollars in Minnesota that we raised, and yeah. then the Reach, Renew, Rejoice campaign yeah. for new church development, over $3 million yeah. that we and, were able to, $2.7 million. Dollars, so. Yeah, $3 million each conference. Yeah. Still, still funding a lot of the new yeah, church development. Yeah, it's getting stuff. towards the yeah, 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 still, yeah, yeah. but it has. But it's I'm not coming amazing. back. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been amazing. So there's been some yeah. really successful impact and really yeah. building the work on each other to mm -hmm. say, well, what's been here and how can we come build on that? We all know the church has plenty of struggles going forward. We all know that. So I'm just curious what you see are the opportunities for the church going forward. You know, I, I feel like I've spent almost 45 years mm -hmm. trying to get people to change. It's humbling because mm -hmm. I feel like COVID flipped a lot. You know, it's like there's no normal and we're not going back to normal. And for those who realize this is an opportunity to act on some things that, that they, lo some local churches would never have been able to do, but because of COVID, they were all down for it, mm -hmm. you know? And so to stay kind of unfrozen and yeah, try how do we new, do that? new things. I, it perhaps speaks to the role of disruption, <laughs> but it was all beyond us. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, hopefully in some small way, all of that, you know, helping people think about other ways of doing things, you know, help fill in the cracks at times. There's so many famous who said, and I think you both coined it too, you don't waste a good crisis, you know? Exactly. So <laughs> how, do you, how do you walk into that opportunity? Mm -hmm. You see any opportunity for the church or something you're hoping the church you know, would be leaning into? Well, I'll never forget the conversation I had with uh, the uh, Lutheran bishops in Minnesota, which of course we all know that's, uh, uh, you know, we, we live in their shadow. Mm -hmm. Uh, shortly after uh, their General Assembly had voted uh, to be to open the church to be much more inclusive and they had all just uh, come off of their first synod meetings after that and they said the cloud has lifted mm -hmm. yeah now we have to figure out how do we move forward I think we're right there mm. certainly um, the disruption, the kind of shaking out, the continued splintering is going to happen for some while. And it grieves me. I mean, mm -hmm. it grieves me every time I mm -hmm. hear a story of a church leaving or a pastor, some of whom I helped nurture, yeah. some of whom I helped, I helped, I ordained mm -hmm. leaving. It grieves me. But I do think an opportunity is that perhaps without the battle always right there in our faces, at some point there'll be a chance to sort of say, how do, can we move forward and reclaim, as I was trying to say this morning, can we reclaim our mission? Can we get back, can we get back to what we're supposed to be doing? Kind of the remembering and, of and who, who we are, yeah, right, but not, we not are. living back yeah. there, the remembering that yeah. takes us into the future. And with some joy. Yes, yeah. yes, with some joy. Now, at the same time, I'm, I want to be honest. I don't know, I don't know if we have it in us because it's been so long since we've been bold and transformative in our decision making. But while the pond is unfrozen, while the disruption has got everything sort of stirred up, the waters are churning, we gotta pick up our mat and walk now mm -hmm. and get in there, get in that pool, or it won't be long before it freezes over again. And it'll just be, we'll just be smaller and we will have 
seen a lot of our beloved sisters and brothers and congregations go someplace else, but we may not have seized the moment. So mm -hmm. I, yeah, the opportunity's there, but um, we, we've got to step up. I mean, my prayer for these new bishops we're electing is, oh, help us live into it, be bold. You know, because some of us have been around so long, we're not so sure we know how to anymore. It goes back to what you talked about when you said you weren't elected and then you're able to sort of let go of things. And I wonder yeah. if we're in a, in a season, I find at least, I'm in a season of kind of letting go. It's like, well, I don't know how this is going to turn out. It's okay. I'm just going to yeah. let go of it. And to be more playful, more joyful, right. more fun with it, and just see where the spirit might lead and get surprised by yeah. that. And, yeah. Well, thank you so much for the conversation, and thank you both for your um, leadership and your service to the church, and I thank you for the privilege I had to work with both of you. So thanks yeah. for taking the time for the conversation today.